Ever since I heard the howling wind I didn't need to go where a Bible went But then you know you'll get seen heaven sent Just lead me to a collar, Dad, that's the thing I don't know how you house the sin. I was never sure how much of you I could let in. Won't you settle down, baby? Here your love has been. Heavenly Father, it's definitely love. You don't carry other names Good morning, friends. My name is Trevor Brisbane, and I'm the minister here at Humber Valley. It is so good to have you with us. Thank you for stopping by. Let me begin by saying that whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you've done, or perhaps whatever you've left undone, whomever you love, however you identify, you are welcome here. You belong here. So usually at the start of our gatherings, when this place is full, we do something really cool called the passing of the peace. It's an ancient Christian tradition where we purposely pause in a world that so often minimizes and criticizes and judges. And instead, we look at each other. We, we notice each other. We, we see each other. And with a handshake or a hug, we become present for each other. And in saying the simple line, the peace of Christ to you, we declare that each one of us, you watching right now, wherever you are, are beloved and worthy of God's deepest love and peace and kindness. Another thing we do around here is pause simply to appreciate and acknowledge the history of the land upon which we stand. I don't know where you are right now. You might be in the neighborhood. You might be on the other side of the world. But wherever you're watching from, I know for a fact that the land you're on is holy. Just as this land where the church is situated is holy and sacred. And it's true that for thousands of years, indigenous people have walked on this land the relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We who are settlers have so much to learn from our indigenous siblings. The church. The church is situated on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. This land is home to many diverse indigenous peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the credit. Again, thank you so much for being here. Drew, will you call us into a place of worship now? Good morning, Humber Valley. Uh, my name is Drew, and once again, it's an honor and privilege to worship alongside of you digitally <laughs> today. I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad we can do this together. As we are called into worship today, it is sobering to remember that when God appeared on earth in the person of Christ, most of the world did not recognize him and therefore did not worship him. Today, we ask for the faith that will open up our eyes to see Jesus for who he really is and who we are in him, that we may worship him in truth. And so I invite you to pray this with me as we begin today's service. Let's pray. Jesus, we open our eyes to see your glory. We open our ears to hear your wisdom. We open our hands to offer you gifts. We open our mouths to sing your praise and we open our hearts to offer you our love. 
Help us to seek and be able to follow your will. May our prayers be joined with siblings in the faith that together we might glorify your name. Amen. And now, let's sing together.
in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, Christ be all around me. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Calls for songs of loudest praise Teach me some that Lord a song if Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace, how great a day, daily I'm constrained to be. Let that goodness like a fitter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy thoughts of God's water. Prone to wander, my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have you ever had an encounter with someone that you just, you just know will stay with you for the rest of your life? 
Sometimes it's the kind of encounter where you are moved to the core and it changes you forever. And other times, the encounter, although meaningful and memorable, it, it, it just sort of becomes a really cool story to tell. It was the summer of 2018, and, and the world hadn't yet heard of, of COVID. Remember, remember those days? One of my best friends, a guy named Sean, was up visiting from California, and he and his family rent a, a cottage near ours every single summer. It was a perfect July summer day. It also happened to be Sean's 50th birthday. So it was pretty special. We had a, a really great night planned to celebrate, and the families were hanging out for most of the day. And it was somewhere like mid-afternoon when Sean offered to take all the kids out in the boat for a tube and then to go for ice cream. Marisol thought this was a great opportunity. She decided she was going to go for a run. And our youngest wanted to just hang out on the dock, so I stayed back with him so he could fish and swim and just play on the dock. And, and, and so he and I were hanging out, and everyone had been gone for a little while. And by this time, it was, it was starting to get hot. So I popped up to the cottage to refresh my, um, my water, right? And as I always do when there's kids on the dock, I explicitly told them before I went up, like, do not go, do not go in the lake. Now, fast forward five, maybe 10 minutes, and I'm coming down the stairs back to the dock with my glass of, I, I said water, right? When, when at the same time, this super nice black ski boat pulls up to the end of the dock, now remember, this is in our cottage, we're at our friend's place, so I wasn't really sure if we were expecting someone or not. And I remember though, my, my first thought being like, wow, that's a really nice boat. So I get down to the dock and, and as is boating etiquette, I walk over to lend a hand tying up this boat, even though I don't know whose boat it is or who's coming in in the boat. And, and as, by the time I get close, this this woman gets out of the boat onto the dock holding the line. And my second thought was, wow, she's really pretty. And she sees me walking up to the boat. So now I'm, I'm clearly, you know, sucking in my, my, gut, my gut and sort of flexing my chest just a little bit. And she says, she says, hi, I'm Cindy. I just popped by to say happy birthday to Sean. And that's when it hit me. This, this isn't just Cindy. This is Cindy Crawford. Yeah, this is supermodel Cindy Crawford. Literally, I had three or four posters of her in my room in high school. And now I'm standing at the end of the dock, three feet away from her, holding the bow line, trying to act normal. Her husband, billionaire Randy Gerber, who owns the tequila company Casamigos with George Clooney, he's driving the boat, and, and their two sort of young adult kids are also there. And I'm I'm in this moment trying to process everything that's happening, and it's then that I notice that Cindy and Randy and, and, and the two kids are looking right past me, and I swear this is 100% true, because my kid is at the other end of the dock with his bathing suit at his knees, peeing into the lake. Remember, remember when I told him not to go in the water? He listened. And, and like, let's be honest, we've all peed in a lake before, but not all of us have peed into a lake before, right? And he was standing on the dock and he really had to go, so he just decided he was going to pee into the lake while Cindy Crawford watches. Sometimes you have an encounter with someone that you will never forget. Sometimes it's the kind of encounter that will move you to the core and change you forever. And other times, it's simply a really great story to tell. Thanks to my kids, you know, really small Brisbane bladder, I will never forget my encounter with Cindy Crawford. And it's become a really fun story to tell. But what about the other encounters? 
What about the kind of encounters that, that move you to the core and change you forever? Because that's exactly what unfolds in Acts chapter 9. Saul is this sort of first century witch hunter, maybe you could call him. But rather than witches, he hunts Christians. And he's off on his latest mission to Damascus to go after a bunch of Jesus people when he has some sort of a vision, some sort of a, 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 an experience where he himself encounters Jesus. And it's a meeting, it's a moment that literally changes the entire trajectory of Saul's life. I mean, after this encounter, everything changes for Saul. He even changes his name from, from Saul to Paul because encounters with Jesus change us. So for the next for the next several weeks, Humber Valley, we're going to be in a series called Encounter. And I'm excited about this one because the whole idea is to put the spotlight on Jesus. It's, I think it's kind of expected these days in progressive circles that we're going we're gonna to talk about God and we're going to talk about spirit and we're going to talk about creator and we're going we're gonna to talk about source. But for this series... We're going to explicitly talk about the person of Jesus. We're going to talk about Jesus as friend, Jesus as teacher, Jesus as Savior, Jesus as Lord, Jesus as love. This series is all about Jesus. Because, I, I mean, I don't know your experience, but... But it seems to me like the more people I talk to, the more I hear people who are leaving the church or, or have already left the church, not because they're in any way done with Jesus, but, but because so often they'll say they're just, they're just done with church. The church just doesn't look or, or love or live anything like Jesus to them. And in my most honest moments, the truth is I, I get this. I get why people leave the church. I've kind of left the church twice myself. I left the Catholic church when I was 16 years old because even back then, just intuitively, instinctually, I knew that I wanted to go into vocational ministry, but I also knew that I really liked girls and I wanted to get married one day, so, so controlling rules about you know, celibacy and, and love were just a non-starter for me. And then, more painfully, I left the denomination that I was ordained in for 15 years. Because in, in that, because in that denomination, anyone who wasn't hetero, anyone who wasn't straight, was deemed a sinner. And al although I am straight, I, I walked away from a large and growing church because I didn't want to participate in homophobic systems operating under the name of Jesus. And, and I'm learning there's more and more of us like that out there. We all know people who have left the church because they're done with the politics or the pettiness or the irrelevance, right? They've been burned by the church or burned out from the church. I have, I have so many friends who walked away from church because there was no room for their doubts or their critiques. They walked away because they, they, if they ask the hard questions, they'll be accused of being divisive. We all know people, I mean, maybe it's our kids, maybe it's our friends who've been wounded by the church and just said, no, no, no. I'm done. And I'm repeatedly hearing things like, Trev, I haven't given up on Jesus. I'm all in for Jesus. I'm just done with the institution and all the, all the crap. I've, I've yet to hear someone say what they really want is all the church stuff. They just don't want Jesus. Right? Nobody says that. People want Jesus. They just can't handle how political and petty and oppressive Christianity can come off as sometimes. So here's the, here's the stone cold fact. I'm just going to lay it out. Jesus is the best thing we've got going on. As a church, as, as any church, Jesus is the best thing we've got going on. It's, it's not any, 
plan that I can come up with or imagine for transformation. Not the best thing. It's not our, our music ministry. It's not our windows. Jesus. Jesus is the best thing we've got going on. So this series is all about encountering Jesus. Now, here's, here's my hunch this morning. Right now, some people are beginning to feel a little bit uncomfortable or uneasy with all the Jesus talk. <laughs> I, think, I think it's fair. I think sometimes talking explicitly about Jesus can feel a little bit disorienting for progressive Christians, right? Like as, like as theological progressives, we want to be inclusive. We want to be expansive. We want, we want to respect pluralistic ideals and other faith traditions. We don't, we don't ever want to impose Jesus as the only option for those who are sincere Buddhists or, or Muslims or, or atheists. So as moderns, as like aware Christians, what, what should we be saying about Jesus? How are we to think about Jesus? How do we relate to Jesus in a pluralistic world? And to be honest with you, I, I don't have a great answer for that. I, I, don't, I definitely don't have a definitive answer for that. Because maybe, maybe we shouldn't have one. Like in Acts chapter 9, when Paul has this encounter with Jesus, it doesn't happen because Paul has the correct beliefs or disposition towards Jesus, right? Remember, if, if, if there was a test or a quiz about who Jesus is and how we relate to Jesus, Paul would have failed it because he hated Jesus. He, he hated everything Jesus was about. His vocational passion was to rid the world of any memory of Jesus. In Acts 9, Paul was changed not because he had the right information about Jesus or because he had the right doctrines of Jesus. No, the opposite was true for Paul. Paul was changed not by information, not by persuasion. Paul was changed because he, he encountered the life of Jesus. And for Paul, it's, it's the encounter that changes everything. In fact, I'd, I'd suggest to you that's the very pattern the scriptures lay out for us. Not that, that it's ever a one size fits all, but in every, every encounter, or in, in the very first churches, they didn't get formed, they didn't emerge as a strategy so that people would encounter Jesus. The first churches emerged because people were encountering Jesus and something so profound, so disorienting, so life-altering and inspiring was happening within them that they, they knew they had to do something about it. It was like, I've been changed. Well, what do I do now? Maybe I should find some others who don't think I'm totally crazy. Maybe, maybe we begin meeting together. Maybe we begin sharing bread and wine together and we begin living for justice and mercy together because something's happened in us as we've encountered Jesus. The church is the result of people encountering Jesus and being transformed. It was never instituted to be the exclusive arbitrator of those encounters. I, um, I recently had a conversation with a young friend who has grown up in a very devout Christian home and has gone to church for the whole of his life. I've known for a while that he's been sort of tormented as to whether or not he should come out to his parents because he's, he's gay. And it was in a conversation we had just before this past Christmas that he told me that he finally did it, right? He finally came out. He told me his parents that he, he didn't want to hide who he was anymore. And as he's telling me this, like, I'm just like, I'm feeling all the emotions for him. I'm so excited for him and delighted for him and inspired by him. And instantly, I, I want to know, like, what, do what changed in you? What ignited in you to come out so courageously to your parents and to the world? 
And because um, I'm a minister and I'm supposed to ask questions about people in their lives, I did. I just, I just asked him. I was like, man, tell me, tell me what changed that you had the courage to now come out. And you know what he, he said? It was awesome. Honestly, it was probably one of the best sermons I've ever heard. He said he came out, and, and now I'm quoting him. He said, I came out because I met the queer Jesus. I came out because I met the queer Jesus, he told me. And, and he unpacked it beautifully for me. He said, Trevor, the rainbow flag is a, is a symbol for all of us who identify as LGBTQIP2SAA. He said, I'm gay. I'm the, I'm the G in that long equation. But when I read the Gospels, when I read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, Jesus is clearly the A. Like, like not once in the Gospels is there even an allusion to Jesus and sex or Jesus and romance. And of course, you know, back in the first century, they didn't have all the language and all the, the nuance and all the understandings that we have today. But Jesus in the Bible, Jesus in each and every one of the four Christian Gospels is blatantly asexual. He said to me, Trevor, he's the A. Jesus is the A. I'm the G. He's the A. And we're both, Jesus and I are both rainbow, he explained to me. Jesus, Jesus doesn't fit a heteronormative narrative for love or sex. Jesus appears in Scripture as asexual. Jesus, he said, is rainbow. And as he's, as he's explaining what this sort of revelation, this encounter meant to him, my heart is beginning to well up. Because, because this isn't a theological you know, debate at this point. This is, this, is, this is more than just a really cool story he's telling me. This is, this is an encounter that he's had that's moved him to the core and changed his life now forever. And it's Jesus. He had a life-changing, faith-forming encounter with Jesus, with rainbow Jesus. And here's my hope, Humber Valley. Here's my prayer for us over the next several weeks. As we talk about Jesus as friend, as we talk about Jesus as teacher, about Jesus as savior, about Jesus as Lord, about Jesus as love, my prayer is that a path will emerge, that there, there will be space created, for us to normalize, for us to celebrate, for us to maybe even expect encounters with Jesus. And out of all of it, perhaps there will even be some more cool stories to tell. For this is what gospel means, the good news of Jesus Christ. For your whole life And when God made you He just messed up Been raised Southern Bell Born and bred for show and tell But you lie down feeling Never good enough I'm so sorry For how it's been We're broken artists With broken pain we paint our pride and call it truth 
I'm sorry no one explained Jesus to you If you heard a knock on your front door But all you found that on the porch Was a pastor that just wanted to be right And if you really want to pray to him But you're never sure he's listening Cause you'd forgive what you did last night I'm so sorry what you heard were broken poets silly words we paint agendas and call it true I'm sorry no one explained Jesus to you oh can you feel him in the Broken singers with broken songs, we paint our pride and we call the truth. I'm sorry, no one explained Jesus to you. I'm sorry, no one explained Jesus to you. I'm sorry, no one explained Jesus to you. Will you join me in prayer? You show up, Jesus. On the road, you show up. In the very moment of disbelief, in the very heart of despise, you show up and change everything. Your stories are never mundane. Your love always pursues us. Your presence always transforms us. Your grace always surrounds us. You show up, Jesus. You show up with a call. You show up with an invitation. You show up because somehow we matter to you. Why won't you give up, Jesus? Why do you speak into our souls? Why do you keep after us? Jesus, show up. We want to know you more. Jesus, show up. Change us like you did Saul. Jesus, show up. Make us into a people that look like you. And so we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, this is the part of the morning where I invite you, if you would like to contribute financially to the work, the life, and the ministry of Humber Valley United Church, um, you can do so at hvuc.ca, or you can mail your check to our physical address, which is also available on the website, or you can call and, and we can arrange a, a pickup if that's better for you. Also want to make you aware, I'm really excited about this. We're all in lockdown. Restaurants are still closed for another 10 days or so. So like next Sunday, what we're going to do is we're going to do a congregational meal, January 23rd. Um, save the date, Sunday evening, dinner time, probably around six-ish. We're going to you know, flash mob a restaurant. We'll let them know we're coming. We'll all do takeout from the same place or a couple places and um, help some local businesses meet together on Zoom, have some laughs, have some fun. Remember we did it last year at Lent? Like it was, it was so good. So let's do that again next Sunday night. Mark that in the calendar, okay? Thank you for being with us. Go now into your week. Go in the love, in the compassion, and the adventure of Christ, for you are loved. In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Spirit of love. Amen. Ever since I 
heard the howling wind I didn't need to go where a babble went But then you know you'll get seen heaven sent Just lead me to a caller dad, that's the thing I don't know how you house the sin. I was never sure how much of you I could let in. Won't you settle down, baby? Here your love has been. Heavenly Father, it's definitely love. Don't carry other 